गुड मॉर्निंग कमिंग टू टूडेज लेक्चर्स इन टूडेज वीक वी आर गोइंग टू कम्प्लीट आवर लास्ट टू लेक्चर्स ऑफ द फर्स्ट हाफ ऑफ दिस ईयर सो दिस सेमेस्टर दीज आर द लास्ट टू लेक्चर्स विच वी आर गोइंग टू कम्प्लीट सो बेसिकली इन टूडेज session we are going to first see the first lecture that is related to calcium and other agents which are affecting the bone followed by the next lecture which will be about the insulin and oral anti diabetic drugs and a brief overview about the different hormones so coming to the first lecture about calcium and related drugs so in this lecture we are going to study about calcium the importance of calcium what will happen if the levels of calcium are increased in the body similarly what will happen if the levels of calcium are decreased in the body and how to manage these conditions and apart from that we are also going to study about the different disorders or the different diseases which are related to imbalance in the calcium levels in the body so there are two different types of agents one are those which help to absorb calcium in the body the other are those which inhibit the absorption of calcium in the body so agents that promote the absorption of calcium and agents that inhibit the absorption of calcium within the first category we have vitamin d its metabolites and parathyroid hormone and its analogs so these are the agents which help to absorb calcium in the body whereas in the second category we have bisphosphonates calcitonin and estrogen these are the agents which inhibit the absorption of calcium in the body now if you see the levels of plasma calcium they the normal levels of plasma calcium in the body ranges from 8.5 to 10.5 mg per deciliter 8.5 to 10.4 4 or 5 mg per deciliter there are two conditions related to this normal range if the levels of calcium drops below 8.5 mg per deciliter this condition is known as hypocalcemia and if the levels are more than 10.5 mg per deciliter then this condition is known as hypercalcemia now what happens in hypocalcemia if a person is suffering with hypocalcemia it leads to too much of excitation of the neuromuscular junction because you know that calcium is responsible for contraction of the muscles and it also leads to impairment in the mineralization of the bones so these are the effects which are seen with hypocalcemia apart from this one more condition that is known as tetany is seen tetany is nothing but uh, involuntary contraction of the muscles because of low levels of calcium in the body so these are the conditions which are seen with hypocalcemia coming to hypercalcemia if a person suffers with hypercalcemia there are chances that he or she may have cardiac problems and kidney stones and apart from that they might suffer with abnormalities in the brain so both the conditions are dangerous to the body now coming to the physiological roles what are the roles played by calcium in the body what is the importance of calcium in the body 
the first and foremost thing as you all know is it is responsible for contraction of the muscles so it is essential for excitation contraction coupling apart from that it also regulates the excitability of the nerves the muscles it helps to maintain the permeability and the strength of the cell membranes and it also helps in the release of hormones from the exocrine and endocrine glands it also helps in the release of neurotransmitters from the nerves and it is responsible for the impulse generation in the heart it also plays a role in the blood coagulation and finally as we all know it is the structural unit or structure uh, it maintains the structure and functions of bones and teeth so any abnormalities in calcium levels in the body might affect any of these organs the muscles might be affected heart might be affected blood coagulation might be affected release of hormones might be affected release of neurotransmitters might be affected then bones and teeth might be affected so the uh, the ion calcium plays many important roles in the body now from where is this calcium absorbed the calcium is absorbed from the kidneys git and bone so in the git tract approximately 10 to 20% of dietary calcium is absorbed and this absorption of calcium depends on the levels of vitamin d in the body so vitamin d helps in the absorption of dietary calcium if a person suffers with vitamin d deficiency then there will be impairment of absorption of calcium also from the kidneys the calcium ion is taken back it is reabsorbed back into the body approximately 10 to 20 grams of calcium is reabsorbed back into the body per day and bones are the major site of storage of calcium if the levels of calcium drops in the body then the calcium is extracted from the bones to maintain the normal serum calcium levels in the body so what will happen the bones become weak so it is necessary that everyone has to take an adequate amount of dietary calcium in their dietary calcium means calcium in the diet now coming to the loss of calcium how calcium can be lost from the bones or from the body it can be lost either as a result of drugs diseases or due to nutritional deprivation so there are certain drugs which might lead to a drop in levels of calcium or there are certain diseases which also leads to a drop in the levels of calcium or if the person is not taking adequate dietary calcium then also their levels of calcium drop in the body now the diseases can be those diseases which cause a disorder in the metabolism of calcium and these bone diseases may be associated with you know mortality because the bones are if there is no proper reabsorption there is decrease in the dietary calcium and it's factor from the bones so the bones become leading to fracture easy fractures now such type of diseases can be treated drugs but this treatment depends upon the cause and the severity of the disease 
the first condition which we are going to see is hypocalcemia so as i told you if the levels drop below 8.5 mg per deciliter that condition is known as hypocalcemia now what can lead to hypocalcemia a condition known as hypoparathyroidism or pseudo hypoparathyroidism can lead to hypocalcemia hypo means decrease parathyroidism means low levels of parathyroid hormone parathyroid hormone is a hormone which is released from the parathyroid gland so if the gland is not able to release amount an adequate amount of parathyroid that condition is known as hypothyroidism or if the body systems to resistant to the parathyroid then that condition is known as pseudo hypothyroidism so basically the levels of parathyroid hormone will in the body either the levels will drop or there will be parathyroid in the body but the body will become resistant to that so in both the condition both the condition will lead to hypocalcemia now these imbalances in the metabolism may be either due to why will be there imbalances in the calcium metabolism it will be due to increased excretion of calcium from the body or decreased levels of vitamin d in the body or decreased bone resorption in the body will lead to imbalances in the calcium metabolism so decreased levels of vitamin d means the active form of vitamin d will be less the active form of vitamin d is known as calcitriol so calcitriol is known as the active form of vitamin d as i told you earlier vitamin d helps in the absorption of calcium decreased bone resorption bone resorption means of the bone by the cells which are known as osteoclast cells osteoclast cells these are the cells which helps in the breaking down of the bone which helps in bone resorption why do they break down the bone if the levels of calcium the plasma calcium are less then these osteoclasts they extract the calcium from the bone and they cause an increase in the levels of calcium in the plasma now how are we going to manage this condition so if the levels of calcium are dropped in the body then supplementation of calcium should be given that is calcium supplements in the form of calcium gluconate vitamin d can be given also vitamin d can be given as a supplement and calcium can be taken in the form of diet so vitamin d leads to the absorption of calcium or both vitamin d or and calcium supplements can be given together so this helps to treat the condition hypocalcemia coming to the next condition that is hypercalcemia as i told you hypercalcemia means increase in the levels of plasma calcium in the body any increase above 10.5 mg per deciliter is known as hypercalcemia now this hypercalcemia can be due to hyperparathyroidism that means the parathyroid hormone uh, sorry the parathyroid gland is very active 
and it is releasing too much of parathyroid hormone or this para hyperparathyroidism may be due to renal diseases also or it might be due to a parathyroid cancer so due to this cancer too much of parathyroid hormone is releasing or it can be due to another protein producing malignancy which also releases too much of parathyroid hormone or it can be due to another type of cancer which is known as, which can, which leads to bone wasting it is known as bone wasting neoplasia now what do you mean by bone wasting bone wasting means the bone becomes weak okay osteoporosis is one of the type of bone wasting neoplasia so these are the conditions which leads to hyper calcemia now what are the adverse effects of hypercalcemia it can lead to abdominal pain too much of calcium in the body can lead to abdominal pain nausea vomiting constipation kidney stones formation of kidney stones and calcification of soft tissues that is formation of stones or the uh, soft tissues they become calcified now the hypercalcemia can be classified into mild moderate and severe mild condition means there is a little bit increase in the levels of calcium maybe 1 mg per deciliter 10.5 to 11.5 now for that what should be done because the levels of calcium are more calcium should not be taken into the diet dietary restriction of calcium should be there if somebody is suffering with moderate type of hypercalcemia uh, if the levels are uh, ranging between 11.5 to uh, 14 mg per deciliter then for them also dietary restriction should be there and if need arises for immediate decrease in the calcium level then diuretics will be given if the kidneys are working properly then diuretic drugs are given to such type of people so even have studied diuretic medications we have seen that diuretic drug they cause an increase in the excretion of ions calcium sodium potassium so here the diuretics can be used for the treatment of hypercalcemia because the diuretics cause the excretion of calcium ions and if the renal function is not proper then dialysis should be done in order to reduce of calcium so one example we can give here is the furosemide which belongs to the category of loop diuretic it causes the excretion of sodium as well as calcium ions next coming to severe hypercalcemia severe condition of hypercalcemia is life threatening and it requires immediate treatment so immediately to rapidly reduce the levels of calcium iv administration of bisphosphonates is given with the combination of calcitonin or without the combination of calcitonin so these are the management procedures i mean to how to treat the severe hypercalcemia condition severe condition is uh, if the levels of calcium are as high as more than 14 mg per deciliter so other management procedures are we can give sodium sulfate edta etc what what do these drug, what do these agents do these agents they react with calcium and they form complexes with calcium and cause the excretion of calcium from the body 
diuretics as i told you earlier that can be given they excrete sodium as well as calcium from the body and glucocorticoids can be given these drugs they decrease the absorption of calcium and increase the excretion of calcium because we are discussing about hypercalcemia we want the calcium to be excreted from the body we want the calcium not to be absorbed in the body so these are the management procedures for hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia now apart from these two conditions we have other conditions also which arises in the body due to imbalances in the levels of calcium these conditions are rickets osteoporosis osteomalacia paget's disease all these are some of the other conditions which a person might suffer due to imbalance in the levels of calcium coming to the first type that is rickets so you might all, all already know rickets is due to you know less uh, bone formation or you can say less uh, mineralization of bone especially during the development during or before childbirth or immediately after the childbirth that condition is known as rickets if the same condition is seen in adults inadequate bone mineralization if it is seen in adults that is known as osteomalacia now what to do in such type of situation in such type of situation calcium should be administered vitamin d can be administered or both can be administered so <coughs> excuse me this condition might be due to dietary insufficiency of calcium or it might be due to vitamin d deficiency or deficiency of the active form of vitamin d or resistance to any of these conditions so ultimately leads to a decrease in the levels of calcium in the body and the treatment can be administration of calcium or vitamin d or both together next coming to the second type of disorder that is the paget's disease now paget's disease is due to excessive bone resorption and formation what will happen if too much of bone resorption is there bone resorption means breakdown of bone so too much of bone resorption is there it leads to an abnormal microstructure of the bone so too much of calcium is coming out of the bone then the bone will become weak that type of bone is known as pagetic bone or sclerotic bone in the x ray also this type of bone looks different from the normal bone it looks more radio opaque than the normal bone so if the paget disease is milder it will not have any symptoms but if there is a severe form of paget's disease then it will lead to deformities in the skeleton and there will be spinal cord depression and there will be changes in the joints in the skull thickening of the bones will be there and hearing impairment can also be seen so these are the symptoms which are seen when a severe form of pagetic disease is there now how to treat such type of condition so definitely calcium and vitamin d can be given to such type of people and apart from that other agents or drugs can be given which cause a decrease in the bone resorption so such type of agents can be given such as bisphosphonates estrogen 
calcitonin, etc. So all these agents they help to decrease the bone resorption. Next, coming to the next disorder that is osteopenia and osteoporosis. So you might have, you all are familiar with these two conditions also. In these conditions also, the bones become brittle, the strength of the bone will be less, and the patient suffer with an increased risk of fractures. So with a simple, uh, you know, injury, there will be a suffering of fracture because the bones are not strong. Now, what, why such conditions arises? What are the indicators? What are the risk factors about, uh, for osteopenia and osteoporosis? First of all, if the estrogen levels are less, then it might lead to osteoporosis. Or by during birth or just before birth, if the thickness of the bones is less, if the stature is small, if there is a family history of osteoporosis or osteopenia, then also these conditions are seen in the people. Hyperparathyroidism also leads to such type of condition. Immunosuppression, if the immunity is less, especially with other drugs such as corticosteroids. And to If there is a person is immobile for a long period, then bones become weak. How can we know if a person is suffering with osteoporosis or osteopenia? So, diagnosis can be done by determining or measuring the density, bone mineral density of different regions of the bone or different bones. There are two types of treatments, the non-pharmacological and the pharmacological treatment. Non-pharmacological means without any drug. So first, uh, the non-pharmacological treatments are preferred by giving, asking the patient for, you know, mild exercises, muscle strengthening exercise, and uh, within their tolerance level not very uh, aggressive exercises and also the patient is asked to be careful to reduce the risk of fractures like falling or any other thing which might lead to fracture. Pharmacological treatment means drugs should be given. Again calcium and vitamin D can be given. Apart from that anti-resorptive agents can be given. Anabolic agents can also be given. Anabolic agents are those agents which helps to form uh, stimulate bone formation. So such type of agent. In the uh, calcium supplements, we can give calcium carbonate, calcium gluconate, calcium lactate. Any form of calcium supplement can be given, which can provide approximately 1 to 1.5 grams of calcium per day. In the anti-resorptive agents, calcitonin and bisphosphonates are there. Anabolic agents, which helps to promote the bone growth or which helps to stimulate bone growth, that is periparatide. So these are the agents, the pharmacological drugs that can be given to treat the osteoporosis or osteopenia situation. Next, coming to the related drugs, first we are going to see about vitamin D. So, vitamin D3 is also known as cholecalciferol. It is the natural form of vitamin D in humans and it is synthesized in the skin from cholesterol in response to sunlight. So, whenever we expose our skin to sunlight, the cholesterol which is present in the skin, it helps to uh, produce vitamin D. Another form of vitamin D that is vitamin D2 is known as 
ergocalciferol. D3 is cholecalciferol. D2 is ergocalciferol. This type of vitamin is obtained from natural sources, especially from plants. Both these vitamins are present in the diet and they are equally effective. Now the activation of vitamin D requires a chemical reaction. That is, it requires hydroxylation in the liver and the kidneys. In the liver, the vitamin D is hydroxylated to calcifidiol. That is, the generic name is 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Now, this is the primary circulating metabolite. So, activation of vitamin D usually occurs in the liver and kidney. What are the different vitamin D metabolites? What do they do? The vitamin D metabolite, they inhibit the secretion and the synthesis of parathyroid hormone. The first thing. The next is it affects the differentiation of other cells including keratinocytes keratinocytes are cells which are present in the skin which uh, produces the keratin rapidly absorbed after oral administration and liver helps in absorption of vitamin d the bile salts helps in absorption of vit uh, vitamin d if somebody is suffering with, uh, you know, any problem in the liver, that is biliary cirrhosis or, uh, you know, excessive loss of fat in the feces, which is known as statoria, in this condition, the absorption of vitamin D will be affected. As you all know, vitamin D can be used in the treatment of decades, osteomalacia, hypocalcemia, etc., now, if too much of vitamin D is present or its metabolites are taken, what will happen? Too much of calcium will be absorbed, leading to hypercalcemia. So, too much of vitamin D leads to hypercalcemia. So, this is about the vitamin D3. Next, coming to the parathyroid hormone. So, parathyroid hormone, as we discussed earlier, it acts directly in the kidneys and it causes a decrease in the reabsorption of phosphates and increase in the reabsorption of calcium. So what will it do? It causes increased levels of calcium in the body, decrease in the levels of phosphates in the body. So parathyroid hormone or parathyroid gland is the first one to be activated as soon as there is a drop in the levels of calcium. So that can be seen with the help of this flowchart. So when there is a level uh, drop in the level of serum calcium, that is the calcium which is circulating in the blood, so that will be first detected by the parathyroid gland. As soon as the parathyroid gland detects that there is a decrease in the levels of calcium in the body, it releases parathyroid hormone. This parathyroid hormone sends signals to the bone and the kidney. So, uh, in the bone, what will happen? The calcium from the bone will be extracted. So, with the help of osteoclast cells, as I told you earlier, bone resorption will be taking place. That means the calcium which is stored in the bones that will be taken and it will be sent to the blood. On the other hand, in the kidneys, the parathyroid hormone sends signals to the kidneys and the kidneys starts to reabsorb more amount of calcium from the urine. So too much of calcium will be taken back into the body. Also, it will cause activation of vitamin D. 
when the vitamin d is activated it will help in the reabsorption of calcium from the intestine also so from the diet also whatever calcium is taken that will be reabsorbed from the liquid that is urine also all the calcium will be reabsorbed from the bone also calcium will be taken and all the three types of calcium will be sent to the blood to increase the levels of serum calcium or to increase the levels of blood calcium so that is why it is necessary to take adequate amount of dietary calcium if we want to keep our bones healthy if we are not taking adequate amount of calcium through the diet then the body will adjust the level of calcium by taking it from the bones ultimately what will happen the bones will become weak calcitonin now what is calcitonin calcitonin is secreted from the thyroid gland now this calcitonin it decreases the absorption of calcium and increases the excretion of calcium so calcitonin is having opposite action it will not allow it is from the agents which inhibit the absorption of calcium so calcitonin will decrease the absorption and increase the excretion of calcium along with other ions and it also inhibit the activity of osteoclast cells so it decreases both serum calcium and phosphate levels it also inhibit the ost activity of osteoclast cells that means it will not allow osteoclast cells to cause bone resorption but if too much of calcitonin is taken its effect will be reduced it can be used in the treatment of osteoporosis pages disease etc now coming to the adverse effects now adverse effect includes uh, nausea vomiting allergic reactions including rashes etc the same problem as i told you if too much of aggressive use is taken it will lose effectiveness so loss of effectiveness will be same with calcitonin apart from that other git problems are seen such as abdominal pain uh you know gastroesophageal reflux disease heartburn etc ulceration can also be seen in order to reduce these side effects bisphosphonates can be given together with calcitonin and these preparations are available for parenteral administration now what are bisphosphonates we will see later before that we will see the role of estrogens estrogens also belong to that category which inhibit the absorption of calcium so estrogens inhibit bone resorption so that means they are not allowing the bones to be broken down they are not allowing calcium to enter into the blood thereby they keep the bones strong they prevent fractures apart from this the other mechanism by which they help to keep the bones strong is decrease the production of interleukins what is the importance of interleukins these interleukins they cause the activation of osteoclast now what are osteoclasts osteoclasts are those cells which causes bone resorption right so here the interleukins are proteins which activate and they promote the survival of osteoclast cells so if these interleukins are inhibited the activation and promotion of osteoclast cells will be inhibited when the osteoclast cells are inhibited bone resorption will also be inhibited 
when the bone resorption is inhibited calcium remains in the bones the bones remain strong if there is any decrease in the levels of estrogen it might lead to osteopenia and osteoporosis now why will there be a decrease in the estrogen production it will be due to ovarian failure menopause after menopause females suffer with osteo uh, decrease in the levels of estrogen if the ovary is removed then in such situation estrogen deficiency will be seen in women now when the estrogen deficiency is seen what will happen again problems with the bones will start so that is why estrogen supplementation or replacement therapy is given to the women especially the post menopausal women in order to uh, you know delay the onset of osteoporosis and osteopenia apart from that the women who are about to reach menopause the pre menopausal women in such women also estrogen supplementation are started in order to delay the onset of osteopenia and osteoporosis normal people normal women also uh, if they have a tendency to develop any deficiency of estrogen so for them also estrogen supplementation can be preferred coming to the bisphosphonates so all the time we were hearing about bisphosphonates so what do these bisphosphonates do these bisphosphonates act by interacting with the bones the hydroxypeptide crystals which are present in the bones and are they are released at the site of bone resorption so the first generation bisphosphonates what do they do at high doses their action is they inhibit the osteoclast activity they decrease the bone resorption and they reduce fractures so basically they are not allowing calcium to be lost from the bone so the first generation bisphosphonate example is etidronate so this drug it will not allow calcium to be lost from the bone thereby maintaining the bone strength however it does not have any effect in the generation or in the formation of new bones bone growth i mean not new bone the bone growth second generation bisphosphonates are also there they are having similar action when compared to the first generation that is they also inhibit the activity of osteoclast cells and also they have the activity on bone rebuilding also so they uh, you know do not have any opposite action with the osteoblast cells osteoblast cells are those cells which helps in the formation of bone so these second generation they inhibit osteoclast and also they do not disturb the other bone forming cells that is the osteoblast cells so these type of uh, bisphosphonates can be used for hypercalcemia osteoporosis peteal cysts etc so these are the different disorders and the different drugs which are related to the levels of calcium in the levels of calcium in the body 